Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our seventh WAP seminar of the year. WAP equips leaders and change makers with rigorous evidence-based strategies to advance women and gender equality. My name is Maya Sen. I'm a professor of public policy here at the Kennedy School, and I'll be leading the seminar today. Um, the spotlight focus of the gender and public policy seminar for spring 2021 is gender and politics. And we have an incredible slate of 12 speakers in the series who will be joining us virtually from around the world. And today we're very lucky to have Dr. Nadia Brown presenting her research on sister style, the politics of appearance, the politics of appearance for black women political elites. Now, um, to give you some background on Dr. Brown, she is associate professor and university faculty scholar of political science and African American studies at Purdue University. Her research interests lie broadly in identity politics, legislative studies, and Black women's studies. She specializes in Black women's politics and holds a graduate certificate in women's and gender studies. Now, she is author of many books and publications, including Sisters in the State House, Black Women and Legislative Decision Making, and has over 40 publications that have appeared in top journals, such as the Du Bois Review, Politics, Groups and Identities, Political Research Quarterly, and the Journal of Women, Politics and Policy. Um, she is also the founding board member of Women Also Know Stuff, which is an online consortium of women political scientists. And she is a spearhead, spearheaded and is a great leader in the hashtag Me Too Poly Sci Collective, where she has really stepped up and is leading efforts to stop sexual harassment in the discipline. Um, and I should note that uh, Nadia will be a professor of, a full professor of government and director of women's and gender studies at Georgetown uh, this summer. So um, just some uh, logistics, we welcome WAP's podcast community, which has downloaded seminars over 59,000 times. We are so pleased to have a lasting and broad reaching impact beyond those who are able to attend today. Um, so in terms of how today's gonna work, um, Dr. Brown will speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll have 15 minutes for question and answers. Uh, we ask that you hold your questions until the end of the talk and those who have a question will have the opportunity to be unmuted and then to ask your question out loud. Um, we do ask that any audience questions be brief on topic, posed in the form of a question and related to Dr. Brown's research. And our colleague here, Katie Olmberg, will be managing the Q&A portion of the seminar. Um, so with that said, I will turn it over to Dr. Nadia Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. And thank you to the WAPS organizers um, for allowing me to share um, my research with you today. Um, this is a great honor. And um, again, as I was sharing earlier, this is a highlight of my week. I want to um, just go ahead and let you know in advance that you will probably hear kids and dogs in the background. It's one of the things that happens when you are working from home during COVID. And I have three small kids and a dog. So I'm sure there'll be. Um, some interruptions somewhere at some time. So I'm gonna talk with you today about the politics of appearance for black women um, political elites. And this is from my new book with Danielle Lemmy. So in this book, we take seriously the premise that not all black women political elites are the same. And this might be readily, most readily seen in Stacey Abrams and Kamala Harris who, um, if you're paying attention um, to, to the news cycle, are really heavily in the news, um, particularly this week, around issues of immigration reform and around voter um, disenfranchisement and suppression. So um, Stacey Abrams' picture here on your left ran unsuccessfully for governor in 2018. She would have been the first Black woman to be elected governor in the history of the United States. In 2018, she went on the syndicated talk show, The Breakfast Club, which is um, an urban radio, um, an urban talk show on a, on a radio station based out of New York City, and shared with the co-hosts that although she is the most viable person in the race for governor, that she is not seen as electable because she's dark skin, natural hair, heavy set, and unmarried. While um, the, the co-host of the, of the talk show really pushed back and they said, oh my gosh, you are so qualified, right? You are um, a graduate of Spelman University. You have a law degree from Yale and you served in the Georgia, uh, served with the minority leader in the Georgia State Senate. You have all the right qualifications for governor. 
Okay, so now let's juxtapose this to Kamala Harris. Hit picture here on your right. She is, as you know, the Vice President of the United States of America, the first Black woman and Asian woman to hold this post. Also the first uh, graduate of historically Black College or University to serve in this position. But while she was California State Attorney General, uh, she hosted a private fundraiser for Barack Obama. And um, when Barack Obama was introduced, he thanked her and said that she was the most attractive state's attorneys general. And the people in the crowd kind of laughed. And this, um, this kind of lighthearted thank, thank you went viral. And feminists um, and other female politicians quickly um, chastised President Obama for this 2013 comment to say, you know, she is a qualified individual. She should not be reduced to her looks, right? We, instead, we should be praising her for the job that she's doing at the state's attorney general. Barack Obama later calls her up and, um, and as both she and Obama um, recount that he apologized for calling her attractive. But these two instances, right, are the lens in which um, the study kind of takes place. So first, no one at any point of this said that Kamala Harris was not attractive. Secondly, no one said that Stacey Abrams was attractive, right? And part of this boils down to their phenotypes. And this is what I, um, Danielle and I study in this book. Stacey Abrams is the descendants of um, sharecroppers in the United, in United States, particularly in Mississippi, um, whose lineage dates back to African enslavement in the United States. Kamala Harris is the daughter of a Jamaican father and a South Indian woman, woman who immigrated to the United States. So they have different, um, different backgrounds, different cultures, different ancestry, but in American politics, we read them both uniformly as black women. But these two small vignettes that I point to share how differently they are perceived by American populations. So this brings me to the point that, um, that the kind of intervention that um, Danielle and I make is why study black women's hair? Indeed, I often get a lot of pushback. Sometimes I get hate mail um, from, from folks who say that there's so many more pressing issues that um, we should be talking about um, in politics, particularly around the substantive things that Black women are facing. But I don't want to exclude hair discrimination as part of that. So we know that Black women's hair has political meaning. If you were to close your eyes and think with your, um, draw up a, a mind map of a person with an Afro, you might conjure up the image of Angela Davis, right, in kind of a very defiant um, Afro symbolizing Black liberation, Black power. Or if you were to think about uh, dreadlocks, you might think about Rastafarianism or Bob Marley, not necessarily the kind of hairstyle that I had um, today or others um, I see on this call. But, right, even though these hairstyles have become mainstream, we still harkening them back to having political meaning, right? And so hair becomes this heuristic in American society. Black hair becomes a heuristic in American society to how people, particularly voters, think that a person with that um, hairstyle, although it's been depoliticized in some ways, it still um, harkens back to having cultural cultural meaning, countercultural meanings for Black Americans. But for Black women in particular, we know that hair has social implications. Um, research by historians, sociologists, anthropologists, and those in women's studies and Africana studies have pointed out for decades that Black women who have the ability to straighten their hair or have lighter skin are able to move up the social mobility ladder. They are more likely to to marry into a higher social strata, to have educational attainment rates that out um, that outperform the counterparts with darker skin and um, hair that is more difficultly straightened, difficultly straightened. And we know that there are these historical maps um, that historical factors that map onto Black women's bodies. Um, so there again, historians have used um, cases in during enslavement in where Black women who were enslaved were punished by having their hair cut or having their hair, um, having brand, have, having um, something branded into their head, right? So their hair would grow out unevenly or patchy or scars. But we know that even when Black women have been, um, had their hair been denigrated or have been used, have used uh, malicious practices against their hair, that they've always flipped it and reversed it, right? That Black women refine their hair and define it for themselves. So um, when colonies in the United States, particularly in the, in the Deep South, 
made restrictions on how Black women could wear their hair because it was seen as um, these elaborate styles that Black women were doing with their hair were, um, were seen as a way to entice white men into having relationships with them. And just as a side note, right, we know that these are not equal relationships, that this is inherently rape between uh, these unequal power, um, people with different powers, but that Black women found ways to create new hairstyles even when they were placed under um, these restrictions. And this happens even today. So turning to like a fast forward look into the, the historical links to politics, my own research with Daniel Lemmy, which is the article that I shared, um, that I shared with you all earlier this week, um, shows that voters evaluate Black women candidates based on their hair texture and style. People read their hair and hair and skin color through lenses that would say you either are nationalistic or you are more mainstream based on what your hair looks like. My own uh, research has shown that Black women's legislative experiences are connected to what they look like. So their experiences in the state house um, are mediated by their skin tone and their hair texture. So that not all Black women have the same kind of privileges or, um, or challenges based on their appearance. And then lastly, I'll end with this, right? Um, that we know that hair is both a site of agency and predeterminism. So what this means is that we can't control how our hair grows or does not grow out of our head. But we, um, but we map onto this cultural practices and significance. Hair is a site that is biological. We can't change, right, kind of how our hair or hair doesn't grow. But we use human hands to manipulate them into styles, to use products and that, rep that um, really reflect our culture and society, what we deem to be attractive in a particular context and time. So this is a really great site to see structure versus agency. And then lastly, what animates this work is a really through line of respectability politics. And so we know that respectability politics is a tactic that Black Baptist club women used at the, at the Reconstruction period to try to outperform whiteness, to say that they were humans and were um, and should get the same kind of respect and be treated with dignity that white Americans were treated with. So this idea is combating racism and sexism by just trying to outperform the white Victorian norms and modes of the day, which showed to white Americans that black people were deserving of, um, of their respect and of citizenship. Um, for whites right after, um, right after the Civil War. But um, recent feminist scholarship has really pushed back against this as well as um, black activists, right? Who've said that black folks do not need to be respectable to be treated as humans. Instead, their own humanity should not be tied to how they behave. And so there's a need to stop trying to map on to, um, to how people dress or look or their accomplishments for black Americans not to be killed in the streets, right? Um, so that you don't have to be a professor to have the same kind of dignity that a person who is not, uh, a black person who is not a professor um, is able to have. But then um, again, feminist scholarship is saying that the black female body is one way that we see the, the way that respectability is reinscribed over and over and over again. So I use the example of Michelle Obama's um, outfit that um, really tore the internet up at the um, inauguration. And um, right, she was really seen as one of the most prolific dressers um, and stylists uh, at that, at the January inauguration. But after, uh, but the internet really took, um, took other black women to task and use Michelle Obama as the benchmark, right? And so because it was during COVID, Michelle Obama had on a mask, it was cold in January in DC, she had on a full length wool coat um, and a kind of like turtleneck, a pantsuit. And so really all you saw from this outfit um, on her body was her eyes. And black women who choose to show more skin were seen as being um, disrespectable, right? And that they weren't uh, worthy of the same kind of admiration that Michelle Obama had. And so these were recent conversations, right? That you just see respectability politics doesn't go anywhere. It just kind of shifts and moves. So what I do in this project is what I like to call a deep dive into an intersectional mess. I take this title from Wendy Smooth's work, um, Intersectionality is a Mess Worth Making. And I try to amplify this by saying, yeah, it's a deep dive and it's messy, so let's get into it. So this first picture here on your left is a picture of Councilwoman Edwards in, in the Boston City Council, who in 
two years ago, maybe three years ago, yes, 2001 now, three years ago, took to the Boston City Council to advocate for the Crown Act. And the Crown Act is a bill that is working its way through the federal government right now, but it's also been passed in 20 um, localities, whether it's state legislatures, municipalities, or in um, like um, towns or, or city councils. And that would prohibit uh, hair-based discrimination um, by the hair that you grow out of your head, right? So if your hair is coily or coily or kinky and it requires different protective styles in order for it to grow, that this should not be a reason why school children are, are kicked out of school. Uh, women, uh, particularly black women have been fired from positions because of the hair styles that they wear. Um, and that they cannot, and that they can also be discriminated against in housing. So um, Councilwoman Edwards spoke at her, the Boston City Council to share her own experience as a young child in the Boston public school system and being asked to leave because of her hair texture. And in this very public um, hearing, she said that she didn't want other black girls and boys to go through the same experiences that she had. It was a very powerful and moving testimony. This middle picture is when Kamala Harris was still running for, for president. So this is back during the primaries in 2019. Um, and she is campaigning for a black woman's vote in a beauty shop. So I love this picture for a couple of reasons. First, right, it's kind of uh, pushing back on this notion about black politics as being transactional, where politicians come into black communities only to ask for their vote, extract that vote, and aren't seen until four years later when it's time to reelect someone again. So you see um, another black woman speaking with a black woman on her terms and her community, right, which at least on the face value of this, right, the symbolism is so powerful there. The symbolism is also powerful because it harkens back to the empowerment spaces that happen in beauty salons for Black women. Remember, it was Madam C.J. Walker, the first Black woman millionaire, who built her empire on empowering women through hair care practices and routines. Um, Walker agents, people that worked for Madam C.J. Walker selling her hair care practices and, um, and products, were then able to leave the kitchens and the laundries of, of white folks and to actually own their own business as opposed to having to service domestics. They were also free in some places from patriarchal view. So they didn't have to give their money to their men or they could also leave abusive relationships um, from, from men. So it really was an empowering space for black women. And we know from the work of colleagues like Melissa Harris Perry, that politics happens in these black indigenous spaces, right? The black public sphere and the beauty shop is one of them. And then this last picture here is of Kamala, ha I'm sorry, it's of Ayanna Presley on the AM Joy Show, um, again, a couple of years ago, right after she disclosed that she had alopecia. And she goes on this, um, on the talk show, to share that hair is political. And the decision that she made to come out with alopecia, as opposed to wearing a wig or other kinds of ways to cover up the fact that she lost all of her hair, is a political statement. And Ayanna Presley has been very, very vocal about talking about the political nature of Black women's hair. I also want to note here that the last strand of her hair falls out the night before Donald Trump's first impeachment, right? And so it just speaks to kind of the stress, the political stress that Black women are under and how this manifests itself in their hair, their crowning glory. And then lastly, the big intervention that I'm trying to make in political science, not just in this work, but in, in all of the work that I do, um, is to really take seriously this quote of Audre Lorde, right? She says, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched to other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. And I argue that political science has eaten Black women alive. They are compared to, assessed, measured against every other demographic group except their own, right? And when they are um, evaluated against these other groups, it always comes up this deficit model, right? What are Black women not doing right? Or they are achieving in spite of these difficulties, what's wrong, right? And I said, I wanna show what's right with Black women, right? Um, not the ways that look at Black women as a problem to be solved, not crunching us into other people's fantasies of how American politics should operate, but instead giving Black women the ability to define themselves for themselves. 
So here's a book outline, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about chapter three. So the interviews that I'll share with you, the quotes from um, Black and elected elites, political elites, will be from chapter three in this book. And just quickly, the kind of, um, I'm an interpretivist, which means that I seek to make meaning, cultural significance out of what people are saying to me. And so my analysis is holistic, it's contextual. It, it also centers me as a black woman researcher doing research on other black women. So things are said to me that I'm sure would not be said in other kind of contexts if there weren't for the shared kind of cultural understanding of what it's like to live in the United States as a black woman and particularly a black woman with natural hair. I've been conducting interviews with several of these respondents since 2009, so it's a long ongoing relationship. And they represent a, um, a variety of elected offices from local to state and national. And most of the interviews are about 45 minutes to a half an hour, but several of them are repeated interviews. Because so, again, I've been um, in communication with a lot of people in this study for several years. So what will come next are the women's quotes and how they're thinking about the politics of appearance um, as elected officials. I'm sorry, uh, so the connection to today's politics is that I wanna underscore how respectable norms continue to dictate how black women political elites connect with black communities. I want to show that body politics is part of respectability politics and that hair really kind of demonstrates this understanding of respectability. And then lastly, that the that there are gendered stereotypes that black womanhood um, continues to endure. And so it's not just in this kind of elected uh, elite population, but we can look back to what was it two weeks ago when um, Oprah Winfrey did the interview with Meg Meghan Markle. So while that is not in the um, US context in terms of um, kind of the uh, connections to colonialism and imperialism that we see with the, um, with the British Empire, but that Black women's bodies are still read in gendered and racialized stereotypes in politics. So this first quote today comes from Darlene Hobbs. I'm oh, sorry, and all these women have been get, given pseudonyms to protect their, um, some, some form of anonymity for them. Um, so Darlene Hobbs was running for office and as a Republican in a heavily Democratic district. She has won, run for office numerous times in, um, in Chicago land area and will most likely not win because her views are simply just out of step with most of the constituents that, um, that live in the district that she is seeking to represent. But in this quote that I'll share with you today, there are a couple of things happening. First, she, she's going to kind of conflate African-Americans and Democrats. She's also going to talk specifically to me as a Black woman, drawing on cultural norms and tropes. And then also she's going to um, kind of explicate why hair matters in her particular situation as a Republican. So she says, Republicans don't know what's going on with my hair. African-American voters, I know, they look at what a person looks like. And I say that because I've been there, I know. As far as Republican, I know that they will look, but I don't think it's more of an emphasis as much as African-American Democrats. They, Republicans, wonder how much I'm spending and whose money I'm spending. But I don't think the focus on my hair would be more critical as it is on the Democratic side. I'm sure you know, referring to me. We were raised that we should look our best and be our best. And if you're representing people, that's what's to be expected to look our best and be our best. It's expensive and time consuming. The others whites um, might not have to, but hey, you can't please everybody. So to parse, parse out um, kind of all the things that are happening here, right? Um, and just kind of give you some background too. Her hair did look bad, right? So like as a objective researcher and as a black woman, right? Her hair was not, um, was not tidy. It, was, it wasn't, it was, it, was, it was not attractive. And she explained, right, that um, she hasn't had her hair done in a really long time. It's expensive. So um, the hairstyle that she had was a relaxer and she hadn't had one in several months. She shared with me that her stylist charges somewhere between 85 to $150 for the service and she didn't have the money to get it done. And then also, right, it takes a lot of, um, you know, you have to go back and get a relaxer every four to six weeks. She didn't have that money and she was trying to stretch it out. So because of that, her hair did not look that great during our interview. Second thing, second thing is um, this quote was um, given to me around the time where, um, John Edwards, who was running for president, had a very expensive haircut that you know came out in the news. He spent eight hundred dollars on a haircut, and she didn't want to have that kind of um, 
experience, right? That it would come out that she spent a lot of money on her hair. And so for her walking around with hair that was undid was sort of a badge of saying like, look, you can, I, you can trust me to be a good steward of your money. I'm not going to misuse it and get my hair done with campaign finance, which ties into what she was saying about Republicans and Democrats. The Republicans really don't care. They wanna know for her for her experience, she, she felt like Republicans wanted to know what you were doing with the money and you weren't using it on things that you should not be like getting your hair done. And in some ways, right, she completed that with Blacks and Democrats because she was saying that Democrats are frivolous with their money and are so are African-Americans who would spend money to get these kind of hair services as opposed to doing other things with, with their money. The, and then the last quote, um, the last part in here that I, I want to, um, to pull out is this part about look our best and be our best. And this goes back to this adage that Black parents often tell their children that you have to be better than white Americans to get second place, right? That you have to overshoot the goal in order just to get something less than white Americans because that's the way that race and racism works here. And she says that part of this is also put in performance, right? So you have to look like you deserve this, this role. If you want to be elected to office, candidates um, are looked at like, do you, um, do you look like someone who could be a representative? And for Black Americans, that's two of the same things, right? Doing your best because you have to do more to just get the same thing that an average white person would get. But what's also coupled in this is looking your best while you're doing it. This next quote comes from a woman who ran for um, St. Louis County prosecuting attorney. And this for me is still a pretty um, heartbreaking example. She, um, she lost the election four days, excuse me, five days after Mike Brown was murdered in, um, in St. Louis County in Ferguson. We did the interview four days before the election, and she felt like this was going to be an uphill battle. Indeed, the person she was running against was a 24-year incumbent, and she tried to comport herself in a way that would make her more electable. So she said, I can't win this race solely on an African-American vote. I felt that my twist would intimidate the white population because they see that and they think that you're a militant person, and I'm not. So I relaxed it, and I'm still not happy about it. So she used to wear her hair, her natural textured hair in twists. And sometimes she would take the twists out, which is called a twist out and kind of have a more defined uh, look to her Afro. And she was given the advice that she should relax her hair so that the non-African-American population in St. Louis County would see her as someone who wasn't militant and was therefore someone that could be elected to this position in state, um, the prosecuting attorney. So I asked her about, so like, how did you come to this decision and why? And so this is what she says. I was told that I needed to keep it up during the campaign. So it's Bob, it's been in, I'm in it. I need to have an appointment for a cut and some color and I'm gonna go back natural after the election. My husband prefers my hair straight and long and I find it to be boring. I think it makes me look older. Even as professional as I am, I think there's still something about me. I still look something a little fun. When I think about professional, I think of at least clean and put together. Could I have pulled it off with my natural hair? You know, I'd like to think I could have, but I'm also in Missouri. So what's also so disappointing for me in, the, in this quote is she's changed her hair. She kind of knows the writing on the walls that she's not gonna win this election. She's done all these things for other people, right? Even her husband who prefers her hair a certain way, which is not the way that she wants her hair to look. And yet she knows she's not gonna win this race. And she has, and a, and a relaxer is a chemical process that, um, that changes your hair in order to um, get your hair back to its natural state, you either have to cut off the relax ends or grow it out. And that usually takes a series of months to do, up to maybe some years. And so she did this extreme process on her hair to please everyone else and she still loses. This next quote is from a, um, a woman who was a long time um, school board member. And when I asked her to describe um, herself and if she was going to meet someone for the first time and you know, would say, hey, you know, I'm this person, I look like this, meet me over here. How would she say, um, you know, what, how would she describe herself? And she thought long and she paused and she said, well, I'm trying to be comfortable, help people be comfortable with me. And um, calling it an Afro would make some people uncomfortable. Yeah, I think so. So you don't know what kind of impact your words are gonna have. 
Side note, she definitely was wearing an afro, right? But she did not want to call her hair an afro. And so when I asked her about this, right, she kind of reflected on her long hair journey. And she shared that she'd been natural on and off since the 1970s. And so the entry point to this conversation is talking about when she went natural in the 70s. So she says, when I went natural, I got flat from the old ladies and church sisters. They'd ask, why are you wearing your hair nappy like that? Now this was back in 1971. The sisters in the church were the ones that gave me the most grief. These ladies were into that creamy crack. And that's um, kind of a metaphor for relaxer. They didn't want no naps on their heads and thought that I, we shouldn't either. And when I talk about the church sisters, I'm talking about the old ones, the ones that helped raise me. So they were the ones sucking through their teeth and whatnot. But my peers, yeah, we're different. Oh yeah, we're wearing, letting our hair grow out. But I was quick to say to the church sisters, why are you wearing your hair like that? because I don't think that we need to adhere to European standards of beauty. So there's two things that are happening here, right? One, she's walking through, right, this kind of black power movement in the 1970s, black is beautiful movement. And she's saying, right, wearing her hair was a political statement. And she was really um, trying to move away from European standards of beauty and really embrace blackness as beautiful. But, um, you know, this kind of, um, the, you know, and this is kind of holistically what was happening at the culture in this time. But yet fast forward to our interview in the early, I'm sorry, in the, in the late 2010s, she was saying that I still, I don't have an Afro, right? And so it kind of shows this tension in saying, I'm proud to wear my hair in its natural state but I don't want it to be referred to as an, as an, as an Afro. And I believe that this goes back to this um, mental exercise I asked you to do at the beginning of this talk to think about an Afro in your mind's eye. And the image that you might conjure up is that of Angela Davis and kind of like a defined black power kind, kind of stance. And she doesn't want to be associated with that, even though, right, she was challenging, she went natural for those reasons and was challenging church just as the ones that raised her um, based on that premise. This next quote is from a state senator in Missouri who makes kind of similar um, connections to what the um, school board member was saying. But uh, Joya Muhammad is different because she wore a hijab for, for many years um, when she was running in the Missouri State House as a, as a, for the lower level as the House of Representatives member. But then when she decided to run for a state senator, she changed up her look. Now she shares that uh, she stopped wearing the hijab because it was breaking off her hair around her temples and the nape of her neck. The fabric um, from the material was, was doing that. But um, so when she showed me her campaign materials during our interview, it was much different than how I had previously known her when she was a member of the House of Representatives. So I asked her about this and her response is, your image is nonverbal. You are talking to people even when you're not talking and they're gonna listen, listen to you. I mean, not literally listen to you, but listen to you and pay attention to you based on your appearance. They prejudge you way before you open your mouth. So you have to have this mainstream image, so to speak. A lot of African-Americans are not confident in their own skin and they want to be accepted. So they change their dialect when they're around on African-Americans, their posture, their hair. They allow for people, not all black folk, but many, allow for people to define who they are versus them defining themselves. This is troubling because what was defined as beauty within the African-American community within the first 50 elected officials, you almost had to look like a white person. So in this quote here, right, we're also seeing some two juxtapositions, right? Kind of the, the beauty of the nuances and dynamisms between how people are kind of squaring the circle um, around getting elected and what an acceptable image is. So first, right, she says that she doesn't uh, stop wearing the hijab because she wants to be seen as, um, you know, um, you know, just more mainstream. But yet she kind of does in some ways, right? But um, because she then runs for, for the higher office and gets elected. But at the same time, right, in the same breath, she's also chastising other African-Americans for making the switch this more mainstream look or defining beauty in this more mainstream look. Um, and it's right, and she's accurate, right? The, the majority of black elected officials, right, after um, both Reconstruction and then later through the Voting Rights Act were more lighter skinned and had straighter hair. Again, this is not true across the board and particularly for black women, um, you know, shout outs to Shirley Chisholm and Barbara Jordan. 
but right there is a kind of kind of a look like an Oscar de Priest, right? Who um, many, many consider in your mind's eye as what an elected official, black elected official would look like. And what Joy Muhammad is pushing back to on, on this quote is saying that this is troubling. It's something that black communities should address, but yet in her own actions, right? It, it kind of shows that she's not willing to address this or hasn't addressed this in this manner here. And the last quote um, comes from Ada Appleton. Now, this is a quote that um, kind of started me on this journey of this should really be a book because Ada Appleton was just so forthright in um, kind of how hair mattered for her on the campaign trail. And this was just such an organic conversation that um, again, happened over her kitchen table um, and in, in, in her house. And she was just, again, so forthright about her decision on the campaign trail with natural hair. So Ada Appleton is a member of the Maryland State Legislature. At the time of our interview, she was going up for partner, um, one of the youngest ever in a very prestigious DC law firm. And when she was um, preparing to run for office or thinking about running for office, she said that um, member, several of the older black women in the office and some of her peers pulled her aside. And so she said this, it wasn't just walking around kitchen tables. Instead, it was me walking down the hall at my job and three women yoking me up like, yo, come here, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, yes. And they were like, you literally can't run for office with your hair all over your head like that. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And so she says this in a very joking manner. She has natural hair and a lot of it. And, um, and so she would wear it in twist outs or puffs and ponytails. Um, even as a lawyer, right? And the, the women in her office said that that look was unacceptable. And what she did by kind of like joking and laughing and asking them, what do they mean? They gave her their, excuse <clears throat> me, they gave her advice and then she recruited them to help out on, the, on her campaign. So this was kind of like a double strategy for her. So then I asked her about her campaign materials, right? Because again, like I said, she has a lot of long, thick hair and in the campaign materials, it is straight and again, still thick and still very long. And so she goes to her bathroom and comes back out with a blow dryer. This is her quote. This is the blow dryer. You need this. And she laughs. It's serious business, meaning the decision to remain natural on the campaign trail. But I saw how I did after a blowout and there was very little resistance. But then one of those things I had to make a decision. It's a battle that I really want to fight. <laughs> right. And for me, um, natural hair, it's not necessarily a political statement. And you know, to a certain extent, this is just my hair. So what she decided to do was straighten her hair when she had campaign appearances, but particularly those that were involved with media. When her door-to-door -door, kind of like day knocking thing, door knocking things, she would wear her natural hair however she'd, however she'd like. But she said like, if this is gonna stop some people from voting for her, she doesn't want it to be an impediment. She was seeing um, herself as a messenger to try to bring people's voices that had been underserved um, in her district in Maryland to the state house. And if people didn't see her as electable because of her hair, she wanted that to be the farthest thing from her mind. So she now keeps her hair natural. She um, wears crochet braids or, um, or weaves and wigs while she's in the state legislature or when she's running for office, mostly because it's so much work to do natural hair and time, it's time and energy. Um, but she has not not uh, relax her hair and she still has natural hair. So to conclude, right, the things that the Black women in, in this particular chapter and, and throughout the entire book, right, have shared is that they're engaging with respectability politics. How should Black women look? Is there a respectable look for Black women political elites? And what I push back in the book is there isn't one, right? And so we should be thinking about us as a culture and society that tries to mold Black women into a certain kind of figure that is unachievable for, for many. And what I show in this work is that these kind of conversations are organic within Black politics and Black communities. Thinking about the intricacies of how people see politics, view politics is based on what they look like and we can't think about everything as the same thing. Um, next, having straight hair is the gold standard, right? And um, why is that? And so I wanna problemize this large and later part of the book. And then lastly, as, as you've seen throughout these quotes, that respectability politics remains salient for black women political elites. And I'll stop there and open the floor up for, or open, let Katie open up the floor for questions and answers. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Professor Brown. Really appreciate that talk. 
And if anyone has any questions you'd like to ask, you can go down to either the reactions tab or the participants tab and hit the blue raise hand function. And when you hit that, I'll know you have a question you wanna ask and I can unmute you. All right, so I see right off the gate, we got one from Sarah and one from Pamela. Sarah, I will unmute you to ask your question. All right. Sarah. Okay. Um, thank you. I think this is absolutely fascinating and um, very consistent with observations and such important work. Um, my question for you is how your work fits in with some of the other studies about how women, women generally are judged as political candidates and you know, the one about the UCLA study about Republican women having more traditionally feminine features or some of the studies about women when they wear makeup being termed more. And is, is the pressure on black women sort of just more extreme and um, there's less room for variation or is this how, how does this fit in with general, um, you know, the general pressure on women candidates completely? <laughs> Sorry about my cat. <laughs> No worries. Yeah, no, so so this is um, right, a, a point that a lot of the um, respondents in, in, in my study talked about is that there is this kind of general overview about how we think about women candidates, but racialization doesn't come into play in how Black women are assessed. And oftentimes, um, the women that were candidates in my study talked about how those other studies have um, been read by campaign managers and kind of like these fancy folks who are hired to come into someone's campaign, particularly if it's, a, if it's a high profile campaign, and completely get it wrong, right? Because race is so salient and, and the racialization process is so salient in how gender norms and gender socialization happens that for Black women, a lot of these things aren't as applicable. So these women are also pushing back against not only archetypes around femininity, and attractiveness that their bodies were seen as outside of, right? So thinking back to, um, you know, Venus Hottentot, right? Thinking about Sarah Bartman, whose body is seen as so grotesque, grotesque and is, a, you know, is seen it in um, a circus, right? It's a freak show. Those kind of lineages of Black women as being unattractive, right? Regardless of what you do, whether it's curl your hair, put on lipstick, um, you know, wear the high heels, right? Your body is so outside of this norm of traditional femininity. And so all of whatever you do will, will still fall short. And so these high profile file campaign managers are brought in and they're saying, put this on, do this, right? But but without a, a you know a full understanding about how black women's bodies are read in the United States. And so those, yeah, again, so those those the studies um, right, are intuitive of, our, um, of kind of how women in general are operating within like pretty politics. But I think there has to be a real um, concerted effort to see how this works for Latinx women, for indigenous women, right? For queer, for queer identified and non-binary identified folks, right? It's not the same. And unfortunately, I think that many of these, um, these more recent crops of studies are acting as if all women are viewed and seen the same way. And what I hope that this work does is shine a spotlight that Black women have some distinct differences because of the process of racialization in the United States. Great, thank you so much. And then Pamela, I'm gonna ask you to unmute now. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, you're perfect. Great. Hello, Dr. Brown. Thank you so very much for your presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question, I guess two questions to an extent. So the first one, I was curious about your data and your methods in terms of just navigating the IRB for this, just given that there aren't that many Black women who are like, you know, elected political officials and then trying to use like, you know, pseudonyms to figure out like how to get their narratives together into like, you know, a cohesive book. And so I'm just curious about how you navigated that given that you have particular places that are mentioned, but you have pseudonyms, but like, it's like, there's not that many black women to begin with who are in these spaces. So I'm just wondering how you navigate just yeah. keep anonymity and still like, you know, getting the stories out. So that's one. And the second one is, um, I found it very interesting how you highlighted how different groups of people sort of 
black women's appearances. And I wonder if in your research, you've seen that policing happening more so amongst black women themselves. So black women elected officials who are feeling scared about not so much the white gaze or even the male gaze, but the gaze of fellow black women in terms of policing their appearance and making judgments based on that. So thank you very much. Yeah, I think I'm just writing down your two questions. Yeah, so IRB was not fun. Like, like I'll just <laughs> be real. It was it was not fun. Um, but so the point is right. So the um, because they're elected officials or they are candidates for office, um, anything that they say is on the record, right? And it's not um, you know it's it's my black feminist ethics that say I'm not going to fully expose who you are. But the locations that they run in help to. Um, give context to why some decisions are made and how, right? And I really wanted to take seriously that there is some ge uh, geographical variation in how the politics of appearance and Black women um, are kind of navigating, yeah, are navigating respectability politics and the politics of appearance. Um, so IRB was like fine um, in some ways. Um, they, they were more cautious of me just talking to Black women about things that they thought Black women wouldn't talk about. And I was like, Black women talk about hair all the time. Like, that's the first thing you say when you see another black woman, girl, I love your hair, right? Like it is not, it is not a thing that black folks don't talk about. Um, and so that was the challenge with IRB. It wasn't, you know, and my decision to give them pseudonyms was my decision. It had nothing to do with IRB, right? I just had to jump through hoops to um, get IRB to recognize that this was not a taboo subject and that black women would want to talk about this. Yes, so policing, Black women policing other Black women, yes, <laughs> um, that, that was a big thing. Uh, we did focus groups with um, women in um, Texas politics, and that was really great. One of the, um, I think, highlights of doing this research was doing the first ever focus group with Black women elected officials, but what came out of this was, yeah, intense policing, that the older Black women were really chastising the millennials and some Gen Zs in the room, for saying that, um, you know, like you can't wear this, you can't do this, you can't look like this. And the millennials were really trying to push back. Indeed, like one even broke into tears during, during this focus group. And um, the interesting part about this was that the older women were, um, almost all of them had natural hair. <laughs> um, and they all talked about kind of the same way that the school board member talked about, was like they went natural in the 1960s, 1970s, but they um, felt that that particular look was best suited for your off days, not for politics. So they were trying to impress upon the younger women that like, you know, keep your love for fashion, keep your twist outs, keep your braids, keep the color, all of that stuff for like when you do you outside of elected office. Um, but the but the sad part is right that there is never any amount of time an elected official is not seen outside of elected office, right? So I like guess a black woman running into Target to pick up socks and toothpaste, right? If you see a constituent, you have to talk to them, right? And so if you decided to wear whatever, um, that's still a memory in that kind of constituent or perhaps voter, um, voter's mind. And so that's what the um, older women were trying to impress and the younger women were, were pushing back and forth. So it was a really heated, um, heated dynamic. And I think that's chapter five in the book. So if you wanna um, leap through that, it'll, yeah, it's, it's a fuller account of the messiness. Great. Thank you very much. And then we got a question from Stephanie and then to Sabrina. So Stephanie, I'm going to unmute you now. Great. Thank you so much. And um, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for this, uh, for this expose. I found it very interesting. And actually, I have um, two comments and, and one question. So the first one is that it really brought to my attention when you compare, um, you know, Gracie Abrams and uh, Kamala Harris, and how at the end of the day, the people that got the top job were mostly representing the American dream by immigrants. You know, if we think about Barack Obama and Kamala Harris, they are they are not bringing all of this history and heritage that you know Stacey Abrams did. So I found that very interesting, um, and I would love for you to elaborate a little bit more. Do you think that um, kind of like the American dream weights more? Than, than, than race and ethnicity in that case. So that's that's my question. And, this, and the comment I had was really around, it is absolutely true on how when you are a black woman and you enter a business meeting, the first thing people look at is your hair. And I have seen how, depending on what style do I have, the looks, um, you know, the ambience might, might change. And at the beginning, you know, when I was um, 
starting my career, I did straighten off my hair thinking, you know, I want to fit in. But with the years, I've been like, you know, this is how I feel comfortable and this is who I am. And I also want to say, in a sense, that, or even a statement of, you know, the more people wear their hairs as they feel like they should wear it, the more people will feel comfortable. So, you know, and thank you so much for, for your expose. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, like these reflections are really important. Um, yeah, so I, I do think that right, this complicated notion of the American dream or um, like those that have made it to the highest ranks in American elected office have been immigrants and are biracial immigrants, right, is, is a part that we can't disentangle. Um, um, however, or not however, but and, right, okay, and, um, they are still viewed and distilled down to black, right? And that goes to the racialization process in the United States, right? So um, there are small concessions in which we, I mean, like universal we, are able to talk about diversity among black populations, um, but most uh, societal structures are set up to see people of African descent regardless of their nativity, immigration status, histories, right, ancestries as black in the United States. And so some of this right gets distilled down just because of our own, um, you know, America's very peculiar racialization practice. And so, yeah, I, I would welcome the opportunity, right, to think more fully through um, like the role of like immigration status and biracialness that, or multiracialness that is working in both for Kamala Harris and Barack Obama. But, right, as, you know, but as important as it is, their hair still plays a great role in how they were viewed. So I'm thinking back to the, the image of like, well, I think it was like the four-year-old boy in the White House who bent down, Barack Obama bent down so that he could feel his hair because he wanted to see if it felt like his. Um, and then like the social media, um, kind of all the memes that were going around around the first debate and also in the inauguration that Kamala Harris got a fresh press and people were like, oh yes, right. You know, my, my VP wraps her hair at night, right? Like all of these kind of things. And it's like, you know, although that they are right biracial, um, the products of, of um, immigration to the United States, they still are read in very particular Black American or Black Americanized lenses. Um, and then, like, kind of the point about um, will it change? I think some of us are actively thinking about ways that it can change. So, like, you gave the example about starting off in a profession and trying to straighten your hair. I did the same thing. I didn't um, lock my hair until I was tenured, right? And I wanted to go natural for many years, but I was told on the job market that I shouldn't. And I was studying a scary topic, which is black feminism, and that um, potential people that were trying to hire me would think that I was not, um, I, I was not mainstream enough for their departments. Um, and so I'm, I'm optimistic that things will change because there's so many more people. This naturalista movement is real, it's, it's sustained. Um, but I think what the research shows is that respectability politics isn't going anywhere. So even if natural hair becomes mainstream, respectability will still move to something else, right? And it might not be policing hair, it might be policing something else. Um, but I, yes, I think hair, that, that might change uh, or in some ways, perhaps. But um, but respectability, unfortunately, I don't think it's going anywhere. Thank you so much for that. And then Sabrina, I'll ask to unmute you now. Hi, Dr. Brown. This has been this has been really great, and I will be reading your book. Uh, I have it written down. I need to go grab that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to congratulate you on your upcoming position. Wishing you much success there. Thank you. Um, my question is actually really relevant to the platform we're on. I'm wondering how your research will incorporate the, the pandemic that we are living through and the platforms that we're now engaging on, such as Zoom and WebEx and other conferencing and, and how um, women, Black women have adapted uh, their, their hairstyles to, to reflect the times and how others perhaps have gotten a little bit more um, lax with their hairstyling and their grooming and then just changes and ad adaptations there. So I'm wondering about your plans for research incorporating Zoom World. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> yes, so I have like some kind of like, I was thinking like through anecdotal things, but then also right through the, um, through the scholarly lens. So I did some of this research right when the pandemic geared up. So the second chapter 
um, was me doing interviews during the pandemic. So instead of going and doing the interviews, I had to use Zoom. The first interview, one of the one of the um, respondents, one of the state legislators, was able to log on and so talk to me, saw me as a black woman, and then we had a completely different interaction. The second interview, um, the, the state legislator had problems connecting, so we had to do it via phone. And towards the end of the interview, she said something like, "Well, I don't know if you had, you know, if you're black or something like this, right?" And I was, um, and I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> right, I am." And so this kind of like changed the dynamic, but like at the very end of the conversation. And so what she shared previously about black hair was very cursory, right? It was very. Um, we, were we were discussing the Crown Act, and she was trying to make the Crown Act applicable to so many people, and which it is, right? Like outside of black communities. Um, but then when she learned at the end that I was black, she asked me a question of asked whether she asked me a question about um, reading uh, if I knew about a, a book for kids around black hair. And I was like, yeah, I have that book. I read it to my my daughters, and she was like, and I have black hair, and she's like, oh, right. So this kind of changed the conversation. So even doing this kind of interviewing, like kind of like cuffing this data via Zoom, I think I've seen the difference in quality of the kind of conversations. Also. Um, I think that there will be, so part of um, what I kind of explain in the chapter two is why black hair remains such a mystery to so many people, right? Because we, like we, the American culture, right, does not see black hair care grooming practices, right? They see the finished product. So if I show up on Zoom with my hair like this, you, or anywhere else, like to the workplace, not even Zoom, if I show up to the workplace with my hair like this, you will not see a new hairstyle middle of the day, right? Also, you won't see a drastic new hairstyle maybe until the next week, right after I go away for the weekend or something else, because it takes so much time to do black hair. And right, we also don't see black hair grooming practices in the, in the mass media, right, the same kind of way. And so what um, sociologists have found that many white Americans just have no idea what it's like, many people that don't care for black hair, not just white Americans, don't know what it takes to do black hair. And so their first engagement with black hair is really um, during college, if you have a, a roommate with Afro textured hair or in the military, again, if you have a roommate with Afro textured hair or if you grow up in a multiracial family. For most parts, right, people are just like, can't you just like take those braids out and have it straight in like two hours? The answer is no, right? Like you just can't do this. But I think right with Zoom, and it's definitely drawn attention to the steps that black women have to go through to a black people, well, any folk with Afro textured hair have to go through to get their hair to comport in different kinds of ways. So, um, so you might see a person on Zoom that has their hair covered because they're deconditioning. Um, and then it might come out the next day or the next Zoom meeting in a different kind of hairstyle. But you've seen processes of that if your camera is on or has to be on. And I think that's one of the challenges that we see, particularly with Zoom education, that requires students to keep their cameras on. But there might be great cultural reasons why people don't have their hair, don't have their Zoom camera on. And unfortunately, if you don't have that kind of perspective, you believe that your, you know, that your way that you show up in the world is where that other people can and do. And it's just not, not that case. So yeah, um, I think that we will have to adapt and reflect. Um, I'm hopeful that we won't be as heavily relying on Zoom in the fall. But one of the things that I think that this, um, this moment in time has taught us is that there have to, we have to respect people's boundaries, but that it also gives us time to see how different people with cult different cultures and hair textures and body types whatever, right, might be operating in their own indigenous and organic spaces that we wouldn't have seen if we were just in these brick and mortar um, kind of interactions. Great, thank you very much. And we have just like another minute or two. And so Christiane, I'll uh, ask to unmute you now to ask your question. Hi, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for this. Um, for this talking, uh, I'm from Mexico and I'm, and I'm an African Mexican because my father is from West Africa and my mother is Mexican. I grew up in Mexico, I did sociology and one of my main interests in, in, in the, this field was about the Africans that were in Mexico. And it was very funny because one of the main things that always came is your hair, oh, you're curly or you're done a skin, you're not, your skin is like, um, different so you know in mexico uh africans american there are not that many so me and my family we were like who are you where are you from? where where are you coming from and um so for me it's very interesting this kind of approach because you know the way in america 
the race is is treated it's like negotiate it's not the same in latin america so i would like uh, you to talk a little bit more about this kind of parallelism between you know the race especially, especially black race in in the united states and latin america and you know latin america it's it's just, it's very very big because you have mexico but you know you have brazil this big country with a lot of african american people so it's it's i think that kind of information would be super interesting for me <laughs> Yeah, and for me too, right? Like to, to, be, to be completely honest, I mean, I would love for that kind of comparative study to be done. I don't do it in this book. Um, and I think it's because I, I, I mean, I know I want it to be so intentional about how race and gender map on to Black women's bodies in the United States. And that to take other kind of cultural contexts, it would be, I think, kind of a messy kind of slipperage. Um, so even like comparing, um, you know, so even, even comparing other groups, right? So we know that right, colonial, colonialization and colorism is a thing across the world. And if I were to even try to apply those same kind of lenses to a different population group, I think that it would just miss the kind of specificity that I'm trying to get at here. But I think, yeah, you're definitely, you're right. You know, I think it's, I don't know how to do justice to a study that would be able to take into account all the nuances, right? Like you were just sharing about your own family. Um, and how do I relate that here in the United States to Brazil, to France, right? Other kind of places where we know the African diaspora folks are still dealing with issues around legacies of colonialization, racism, and imperialism that's mapped on to our bodies. Yeah, and even she because Dr. 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 Brown, I actually have to interrupt everyone. I'm really sorry to do that, but we're actually at time. So I want to give the opportunity for the people who have to log off to do so. I invite you to continue this conversation. It's very interesting. Um, and I also want to say before we before everyone parts ways, um, so please join us for the WAP seminar um, next week. Uh, so next week is Professor Reyes Householder from the Instituto de Ciencia Política of the Pontifica Universidad Católica de Chile. Uh, discussing how women win the Latin American presidency. And again, I invite whoever wants to stick around. Um, hopefully, Nadia, you're available for a couple of minutes. But again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Nadia Brown for coming today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.